Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. They're all crazy today. Just want you to know that before you grab the stool, but I highly encourage you to grab the stool because it is a full day of craziness on the Three Martini Lunch. The one thing that's not crazy, uh, the fact that we're sponsored by Figs. Wearfigs.com and enter our code martini at checkout for 15% off your first purchase. Much more on that in uh, just a moment. Uh, Jim, not only is it all crazy today, but uh, two out of three have nothing to do with impeachment. So um, good times, good times. But it's almost Friday. Yeah. I, look, you know, people, some people are like, impeachment? Wasn't that the the old show that was on? It got canceled last last month. <laughs> so it turns out, America, they rebooted it with a whole new cast. Yes. Actually, some familiar faces. And I think we're starting to see why Nancy Pelosi was uh, holding on when it came to the delivery. Uh, I think she just might have had an inkling that some of the evidence from the Lev Parnas case was about to be released to the public. Oh, and uh, the Office of Management and Budget deciding that uh, putting a freeze on uh, military aid to Ukraine actually broke the law. So now they've got those arrows in their quiver heading into the impeachment trial, which starts on Tuesday. Our first crazy martini, though, deals with uh, the stuff from the Lev Parnas case. Lev Parnas is uh, one of these uh, guys. I think he's uh, originally from Russia, but uh, now he lives in Florida. Anyway, uh, he was recruited by Rudy Giuliani. And this just goes down a whole nother road about how Rudy Giuliani or even the president himself decides to pick uh, who they associate with and uh, who they get to do their work for them. But anyway, Lev Parnas is under indictment for a number of things. Didn't say a word to the press. And then all of a sudden yesterday, he spoke with Rachel Maddow of MSNBC. Uh, Rachel devoted her entire hour to it. And I think she's devoting her entire hour to it again uh, this evening. Uh, but here's a couple of clips that has uh, MSNBC, certainly, and a lot of other folks uh, saying that uh, this interview and these revelations are a game changer heading into this impeachment trial. Uh, probably a bit hyperbolic, but uh, here's the first clip. What do you think is the main inaccuracy or the main lie that's being told that you feel like you can correct? That the president didn't know what was going on. Uh, president Trump knew exactly what was going on. Uh, he was aware of all of my movements. Uh, he, I wouldn't do anything without the consent of Rudy Giuliani or the president. I have no intent, I have no reason to speak to any of these officials. I mean, they have no reason to speak to me. Why would President Zelensky's inner circle or the Minister of Akov or all these people or President Poroshenko meet with me? Who am I? And why did all this take place? Are you saying specifically, and I want to sort of drill down on that, that the president was aware that you and Mr. Giuliani were working on this effort in Ukraine to basically try to hurt Joe Biden's political career. He was he knew basically. about that. Yeah, well, it was, it was all about Joe Biden, Hunter Biden. And uh, also, Rudy had a personal thing with the Manafort stuff, uh, uh, the Black Ledger. Mm -hmm. and that was another thing uh, that they were looking into. But uh, it was never about uh, corruption. It was never it was strictly about uh, the Burisma, which included Hunter Biden and Joe Biden. So you got Democrats saying this is the smoking gun. You've got uh, defenders of the president saying, well, this guy's under indictment. He's facing lots of years in prison. Of course, he's going to tell them whatever they want to hear. Uh, Jim, you point out in the jolt today that this guy's got a legal record going back quite a ways for unpaid debts and so forth. So uh, the, the main crazy thing here is just the uh, collection of oddballs and ne'er-do-wells who end up with uh, roles way too close to the president of the United States. Yeah, Greg, I suspect a lot of listeners could hear kind of those sirens in the background. Apparently that was the cops going to arrest Lev Parnas again because he's <laughs> basically spent his whole adult life in one form of legal trouble or another. Um, by the way, I think I'm 90-some percent sure he is a Ukrainian born, but he moved to Florida fairly early on. And he is not this like well-connected Ukrainian mover and shaker, uh, he and Igor Fruman. You know, Fruman is an exporter of luxury goods. Parnas is a former stockbroker, left a long trail of debts in Florida and beyond. He's been sued repeatedly for unpaid debts, faced eviction from properties. Uh, during, his, during his career as a securities broker, he worked for three mortgages that were expelled from the industry by regulators. But that's not all he's done. He worked in an unspecified capacity for a Ukrainian oligarch by the name of Dmitry Furtash. Who is Dmitry Furtash? Well, 
In addition to being one of Ukraine's wealthiest businessmen, he's battling extradition by U.S. authorities on bribery charges from Vienna, where he's lived for the past couple of years. Federal prosecutors say that Furtach is an upper echelon associate of Russian organized crime. Indicted in 2013 and charged with bribing Indian officials for access to titanium mines. So you look at this guy and he's not, you know, some sort of, he's certainly not a Ukrainian official. He's not even a, a guy who's one degree of separation of Ukrainian official. He just starts going to these fundraisers and reaching out to Rudy Giuliani and basically says, hey, we know Ukraine's got good stuff in there. About, about the Bidens. We know there's information that you're going to want to know. And apparently that's all it took to become a really key person in this effort by the President of the United States and, and Rudy Giuliani to get the information out of Ukraine. Um, they give off every single possible whiff of being a, a con artist. They are uh, indicted for, for campaign fraud violation, conspiracy to break campaign fine laws. Anybody with half a brain would look at these guys and say, oh, I don't want to deal with these guys. Any president should look at this and say, uh, these are the most oafish henchmen since Jeff Galuli and Sean Eckhart went after Nancy <laughs> Kerrigan back in the early 90s. You would not trust these guys to tie their shoelaces. Never mind, you know, oh, I need you to execute this secret back channel to the Ukrainian government or anything like that. So you're going to hear Trump defenders say, ah, oh, you, you can't believe anything Lev Parnas says. Look at this guy. He's a criminal. He's under indictment. He's got all kinds of these shady things in his path. And that's absolutely true. The question then remains, why did Trump and Giuliani trust him then? Which I think is a awkward and difficult question to answer if you want to keep a high opinion of the president and or Rudy Giuliani. True. I would also say that this is vindication for the position laid out by your colleague at National Review Online, Andy McCarthy, the former federal prosecutor, who said the smart play for Republicans here was not to claim there was no uh, quid pro quo or, or, you know, try to barter when the aid got there in exchange for the announcement of investigation or something. But uh, to point out that uh, even if it did happen, it doesn't rise to the level of uh, impeachment. And so if, in fact, Parnas is telling the truth here, uh, it, it lines up with what the Democrats are alleging. But uh, even if that's the case, uh, the question is, does it rise to the level of impeachment? And a lot of folks uh, who are smarter than me, including Andy, uh, believe that it doesn't. So I'd be very surprised if this moved the needle much uh, on the impeachment trial. Maybe a vote uh, or two, which could be consequential in the calling of witnesses. But uh, ultimately, I don't think it's a it's a game changer. What do you think? Yeah, I was going to say, look, if de- I mentioned to see how Democrats incorporate this and Democrats have trotted out a lot of arguments that aren't likely to work. And again, I, I think almost everybody decided what they thought of impeachment the moment they heard about the Ukrainian stuff, if not earlier. Right. I mean, either you think the president should stay in office or you don't. Um, and it probably ties a great deal to whether you're going to vote for the president or not. I really don't think you'd see a lot of Trump voters saying, yes, he should be impeached. And I really don't think you see a lot of people who plan on voting for the Democrats saying, oh, no, he shouldn't be impeached at all. Um, I think it just is. This is the same core question. Should Donald Trump be president? And the the, the interesting aspect here is you, you've seen Democrats roll out arguments like, you know, the, the inquiry into Hunter Biden was illegitimate and, and a partisan. Well, I'm not so sure. I think Hunter Biden is there's enough of an odor there to suggest that maybe it was worth looking into that stuff. I just you should do this through official channels and law enforcement, not find Rudy Giuliani's two rent goons from Florida to do this sort of thing. Um, and the second thing is you know, the idea of, oh, this is, you know, he's defying the will of Congress. You know, nobody's going to care about this. The best argument Democrats can put forth here is that any president dumb enough to get involved with guys like this doesn't have the judgment to be president. These two guys were basically running a con and Rudy Giuliani and Donald Trump took fell for it hook, line and sinker. And just the barest minimum of looking into these two guys would have said, wait, who the heck are these guys? How the heck would they know what the Ukrainian government knows? Why should we trust them? What do they know? But they didn't in part because Giuliani and Trump wanted to believe that somewhere in some vault in, in Kiev, there was evidence that would, you know, take down Joe Biden and Hunter Biden. It was um, egregious judgment on their part. And I think that's the strongest argument for impeachment. I don't know if Democrats will bother to go down that road, though. I see these guys as the political equivalents of the wet bandits. Uh, Harry and Marv from uh, Home Alone. <laughs> yeah, you know, they, it's one of those things where they were absolutely certain that this one house somewhere in Illinois had the, had the evidence against Hunter Biden, but they just couldn't get past this kid. <laughs> that's right. 
By the way, there's a theory, of course, that uh, yes, that Home Alone is a diehard movie. Yeah, essentially, it's the same premise, just with a, a little more family-friendly fare when it comes to Home Alone, that uh, a, a kid is there by himself, by mistake. Uh, there's a threat, and he alone uh, can, can thwart the bad guys. Um, I'm perfectly fine with that because I liked Home Alone, and anyone who is uh, smart enough to basically rip off the premise of the greatest action movie of all time is pretty good in my book. So I really wanted to find one cast member that was shared between any of the Die Hard movies and any of the Home Alone movies. Haven't found it yet. I really wanted to find some sort of loose connection or something like that. The only thing I could find, Greg, is that they're in Home Alone 2, Kevin talks. But right, this is obviously what everyone expected to hear <laughs> when they tuned in today. This is so relevant to our discussion of impeachment. <laughs> But, so, but, you know, hey, the microphone's in front of me. This is on my mind. You're going to hear about it in America, whether you like it or not. So in Home Alone 2, the one that features a future president giving Kevin directions to the bathroom, he's in Central Park and he runs, talks to the pigeon lady, who he's initially scared of and turns out to be this nice weird old lady. There's a lady who's running from McLean and Samuel L. Jackson as they hijack a cab <laughs> and drive through Central Park in Die Hard with the Vengeance, the third Die Hard movie. And as far as we're concerned, there's no more than four and a half Die Hard movies. Oh, no. Four, man. Right. Fourth one four. didn't happen. Fourth one is, eh, Yeah, know. fourth one is marginal. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. But so maybe, well, my argument is that the Pigeon Lady is one of the people running from the cab, and that's what connects them as movies. <laughs> and clearly, Home Alone is just another chapter in the Die Hard universe. <laughs> hey, I'll take Home Alone and Home Alone 2 over Die Hard 4 or 5. Uh, I won't take them over 1 through 3. All right. Uh, in the meantime, let's talk about figs. There's no good transition from impeachment and <laughs> Home Alone to figs. But, uh, hey, figs is uh, the top of the line when it comes to great apparel for your favorite doctor, your favorite nurse, your favorite lab tech, your favorite dentist, dental hygienist, any folks in the medical profession, therapists uh, all along the way who wear scrubs or other type of medical gear on a regular basis uh, because it's cold and flu season right now. If you've got small kids, it's probably going around and chances are you've been to get something checked out. Hey, this fever hasn't gone away for a few days. Should I be worried about this or just let it play out? Uh, you've seen a nurse, you've seen a doctor, you've seen a some sort of medical practitioner along the way. Hopefully uh, your kids are, and other family members are getting healthy, but they're there to help us uh, when we need it most. They deserve to wear stuff that, uh, that feels good, and that's exactly where Figs comes in, whether it's scrubs or other apparel. And so uh, I had the chance to get the active wear jacket. I've talked about that a lot. Also had the chance to get the socks. And over this past weekend, when it was like 70 degrees in Washington, put on the socks, went out for a walk with the family. Really, really comfortable. I'd worn them before, but I had never actually worn them out for a, a couple-mile walk. Very comfortable, very nice and snug and comfortable on the feet. Uh, so even if you're not in the medical profession, they've got some stuff there uh, that you'll certainly enjoy. But uh, a lot of gear on there for your favorite doctor, dentist, or nurse as well. Greg, I'm going to help you with a transition here. <laughs> you know, if you're a burglar and you've tried to breathe or break into a house in Illinois or going after a small child in New York, chances are you've visited a medical professional at some point because Kevin McAllister tried to kill you in many times. And that's why you need to appreciate medical personnel. You need to say thank you to your doctor. You need to say, hey, thanks for that extra care. And FIGS creates the highest quality medical apparel so that medical professionals look their best, feel their best, and perform their best every day. Fig scrubs are infused with antimicrobial properties to control odors. They feel ridiculously soft, and they have moisture-wicking properties that features a four-way stretch. Figs are made with yoga waistbands and come in a variety of styles, from classic straight legs to joggers and skinny styles. By the way, speaking of giving, figs make great gifts for the lifesavers in your life. Figs gift cards are available. So next time your doctor, nurse, dentist, dermatologist, or pediatrician saves the day, Tell them thank you by sending them figs. So whether you're one of the great humans that work in healthcare or someone that just wants to say thanks to all these deserving folks, Figs is going to make that easy by providing you with 15% off your first purchase by using our code MARTINI. So get ready to love your scrubs. Head to wearfigs, W-E-A-R-F-I-G-S dot com and enter our code MARTINI at checkout. Wearfigs.com, code MARTINI. All right, Jim, February 3rd, Iowa caucuses. 
pretty big edge now for Biden and Buttigieg, while Sanders and Warren and Klobuchar and, yeah, I guess still Michael Bennett uh, are stuck in the jury box here for the next few weeks uh, as the impeachment trial plays out. But uh, longtime listeners know how much Jim loves the fact that Iowa goes first all the time and also how the caucus process works, because in the last two cycles, one party hasn't really been sure who actually won the caucuses. Back in 2012, on uh, election night, ah, Mitt Romney squeaks it out of a Rick Santorum. Then a few weeks later, oh, turns out looks like Santorum won. Uh, but ultimately, we can't find all the ballots, so we're not really sure. Then in 2016, just talked about this the other day, uh, it came down to coin flips between Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders on the Democratic side. Ultimately, Hillary Clinton won every single coin flip. Imagine that. And uh, she was officially uh, the winner. So now the Democrats are headed towards another major mess in Iowa because they've changed the rules largely in response to the protests from the Bernie side in 2016. Because uh, through 2016, all that ever got reported was the final delegate totals. We never got any votes from the Democrats. The Republicans did, but not the Democrats. So this year, you're going to get three sets of results which could lead to three different people claiming victory or more. So people walk into their caucuses. They get these uh, preference cards. They write down the candidate they like heading in. They count all those votes. But if you don't get to 15 percent, the candidates below 15 percent get thrown out. And the people who voted for folks who didn't make that threshold have the opportunity to vote for someone else. So in the end, they're going to report the initial vote, the final vote, and the delegate count. You would think the last two would line up, but Politico and others are reporting that might not necessarily be the case. So, Jim, you could have an initial vote winner, a final vote winner, and a delegate winner. Ah, oh, glad we cleared that up. Yeah. Um, the short version of this is, as you know, as I suppose the argument for caucuses is, God, we've always done it this way. It's a wonderful tradition. This is my attempt at a vaguely Midwestern Iowa accent. It brings about the whole community, you know, community engagement, et cetera, et cetera. There are a whole bunch of problems with the caucus process, and everybody's just kind of shrugged them off for a really long time under the idea of, well, this is how we've always done it. First of all, let's assume you're a parent in Iowa, and it's a winter night. Roads could be cold or icy and, and all that stuff. You got to go to the local community center or high school or whatever, you know, community building they're holding the caucus in. You better have transportation. Uh, you know, maybe some folks will give you a ride. You never know. You got a babysitter because you probably don't want the little rugrats running around while you're doing all this kind of stuff. So the idea that's kind of exclusionary. If you're stuck on the what, night shift, you can't go to the caucus. If you are sick in bed, you can't go to the caucus. Um, this, this is, you know, you got to be in the community. The second thing is it's not a secret ballot. Um, you know, some years I will say who I voted for. Some years I won't. But honestly, it's none of your darn business. And so this whole idea where, you know, you get there, well, you know, we're going to write down the card. And then you have to stay. Usually if you stand in a corner of a room and they say, all right, everybody who supports Canada Day, you stand over here. All the candidates go over there. Then thirdly, I understand the concept of the delegate threshold. Um, the idea and their the Democrats have enacted this one where you got 15 percent. It's 15 percent or it's nothing. You get 14 percent in Iowa. You go home with nothing. You get nothing, sir, to quote Gene Wilder in uh, Willy Wonka. The idea that, which kind of seems a little unfair, kind of seems a little ridiculous. 14% is nothing to sneeze at, particularly in a crowded field. Um, I understand the idea that you don't want to get into fractions of delegates and, and all that kind of stuff, but it does seem a little harsh that they have this. But now this idea of having all, and the other thing is also that because there are multiple layers, you know, if you're not, if there's only one person who shows up for a little known candidate, the John Delaney supporter, and or John Delaney um, shows up that evening, then then all of a sudden it's like, okay, you didn't qualify. You got to go to somebody else, or I guess you can go home. And I, you know, maybe some people will say, all right, I really like this candidate. I I was really pulling for Michael Bennett. If Michael Bennett's not getting any delegates out of this meeting, I'm walking home. But otherwise, they say, no, no, you, you know, your your guy didn't make it, so you got to go one of the to one of the other ones. And some people might love that idea. I'm not such a huge fan of it. Primaries are just so much simpler. And then you don't end up with this initial number, this secondary number, and then the delegate number. And it just seems kind of weird that we don't know how many people voted in the 2016 Democratic Iowa caucus. By the way, Democrats and Republicans have different rules for this. And uh, for all this claim, Republicans are attacking democracy. Hey, you know what we can do? We don't settle our caucuses with coin tosses like the Democrats do. Well, there is that. Uh, I guess that first round could be beneficial to candidates maybe between the 5 and 10 percent range. I'm thinking maybe a Klobuchar, because uh, if she just winds up with zero because she couldn't get to 15, that would obviously spell complete doom. And even if she 
gets around 10% in that first round, she's probably still done. But uh, I guess it gives you a little bit of a glimpse on where the people of Iowa really were walking in if it had been a primary. But this is just uh, so convoluted and so uh, complicated at this point. And I can just picture uh, Bernie still claiming it's rigged. Uh, who knows what Bernie's field organizer would claim? Uh, he'd probably want to burn down Des Moines or something. But uh, <laughs> I, yeah, look, I'm not saying he's feeling pessimistic. I'm just saying we saw him buying matches and gasoline. Jim, let's go to our final crazy martini here and uh, closer to home now here in Virginia. Things have not eased up in the tension over the battle over the Second Amendment. The Democrats were sworn in a week ago, uh, Tuesday, uh, January 8th, and they have hit the ground Running, they've uh, already uh, passed the Equal Rights Amendment, and that's a whole other story. Uh, It expired a long time ago. Uh, But the big issue is the fight over guns and a lot of different bills, whether it's background checks or banning, quote-unquote, assault weapons or red flag laws, uh, magazine limits, and and on and on. There's a lot of different things here that are potentially on the table, banning uh, gun ranges that aren't owned by the state, for example. And so you've got scores and scores of counties and cities who have said uh, we're a sanctuary if we think these are unconstitutional laws coming out of Richmond. We're not going to enforce them. Uh, Ralph Northam has now called a state of emergency for the gun rights rally early next week. But we've got a solution potentially here, Jim. And it comes to us from the great state of West Virginia, where apparently, and they are not kidding about this, I think, according to Article uh, 6, Section 11 of the Constitution of the state of West Virginia, uh, it permits additional territory to be admitted into and become part of the state with the consent of the legislature and a majority of the qualified voters of the state. So basically, if you're a sanctuary county, you can, if uh, West Virginia were to approve this law, allowing them to apply for transitioning to uh, West Virginia. If you're a uh, Second Amendment sanctuary county, you can apply. Uh, The West Virginia would have to uh, approve that application. Then the people in the sanctuary county would have to vote on it. If that is approved, it would go back to West Virginia and it would get voted on there. So potentially, and as far as I'm reading here, Jim, Richmond would have nothing to say about it. Uh, You could have some red counties actually converting from Virginia to West Virginia. What do you make of this? So my first question, Greg, is do they have to be contiguous? Well, that was the question in uh, in Hot Air's column on this, written by Jazz Shaw. He wasn't sure how that would work. Uh, the West Virginia statute that's being proposed does not specify that. Like, theoretically, you could just say, oh, we're part of West Virginia now. And, like, we're this, you know, kind of like the, you know, put in, in terms for, for your understanding there, Greg, the Upper Peninsula. Yes. Come on. It, it really should be part of Minnesota, right? This uh, should be part of Wisconsin. But uh, the great Toledo border war of the 1830s, uh, led to a uh, compromise where Ohio got Toledo and Michigan uh, was given the Upper Peninsula since Wisconsin wasn't a state yet. So my, my thought was, oh, God, here we go. This is ridiculous. And then after a while, I thought about it, Greg, and I suddenly realized, wait, wouldn't it be simpler to just trade Arlington and Alexandria to Maryland? <laughs> I would love that. Right. And, th- and they've got some red counties up in the panhandle that would probably fit in better with uh, with the rest of the red. Ca- like, so there's a part of me. It's like, so first of all, Every map maker in America is drooling over this possibility, right? The idea that every map we have would be outdated. (laughs) And so now you're kind of realizing, wait, what if we added this to the census? And then it just kind of turned into like county free agency season, where if you all of a sudden didn't like the state government you have, you can test the market (laughs) and see what other state governments are out there willing to give you an an offer. And you kind of look at that and all of a sudden, like there's a bunch of county, like I am sure there are parts of New Hampshire who are tired of these People from Massachusetts, and there's a crude term for them, moving to their state and ruining things, right? So all of a sudden, it's like, hey, you know what? You take those outer exurbs that are turning into, you know, that are basically turning into Boston West. I don't want those those folks. All the uh, Texas areas where the, you know, all the, you know, like Austin, you know, basically like, you know what? You've never fit in with the rest of Texas anyway. We're, we're going to add you to part of New, New New Mexico. We'll add like one long highway that'll be part of the state lines or something. There's a part of me that thinks this is such a crazy, wacky idea that I almost want to go with it. I almost <laughs> want to say, like we all talk about people voting with their feet. Uh, if they don't like one state government, they move to another one and all that stuff. But you know, why should the people move? Why shouldn't the states move? <laughs> Let's and just just get out your markers and start, you know, like we, we redistrict district lines. Let's start redistricting state lines. Let's say, you know what? We're sick. You know, what? California, you're too big. Split them up. <laughs> There's a whole bunch that probably love to join Nevada. There's probably a bunch that'd be OK with joining Arizona. You know, there's there's a lot of potential for this idea. 
Um, so that's my idea, county free agency. And, and all of a sudden, state governments would have to be a lot more accountable and realize, oh, wait, if we start doing really unpopular ideas, we're, we're going to lose a bunch of counties during the next free agency period. It's like having a bad coach and a bad, a bad uh, owner. <laughs> Yeah, you and no, no one about wants that. to have Governor Adam Gase. <laughs> but why limit it to states that you uh, currently border? What if you're uh, a state along the western ridge of uh, uh, Virginia and, and you say, "Well, West Virginia is nice, but I'm getting a pretty good offer from Texas over here or Oklahoma," uh, and then all of a sudden your your map could be all over the place. Uh, this obviously makes more sense if it makes sense at all. But uh, it's it's a fascinating concept. But uh, locality yeah, I mean, at that point it looks like somebody you know your your eventually your map will start to look like somebody <laughs> spilled. One bag of M&M's, <laughs> one bag of Reese's Pieces, and one bag of Skittles all on a floor. <laughs> Every, everything's a whole bunch of really tiny things with, with little colors. So we probably need to keep it semi-contiguous. <laughs> but if you can find the neighboring states, like, hey, you know what? I like what they're doing over there. Uh, give me better terms or I walk. You know, you, everybody could be a, you know, uh, uh, you know, hopefully eventually would some counties become the Antonio Browns and uh, Odell Beckham <laughs> Juniors and – Come more trouble than they're worth, maybe, maybe. And then they cut. Then it turns out no state wants you. You know, like we've, we've had enough of those folks. <laughs> oh man! Well, you and I live in blue counties, though, so I don't think we'd be uh, added to West Virginia anytime soon. But I like John Denver, and uh, I like Harper's <laughs> Ferry, and uh, I've known a lot of really nice people from West Virginia, and it's uh, it's a pleasure to visit. So uh, I can certainly think of a lot of worse things, particularly the longer this Democratic bunch is in charge in Richmond. I mean, I, I still like that idea of, you know, eh, you know what? You'd be like, there's a bridge connecting Alexandria to Maryland already. Exactly. And so it's it, it's basically National Harbor West. Right. And it's the Woodrow Wilson Bridge. So talk about your uh, progressive haven over there. And then, uh, yeah, yeah, other folks. I mean, then the next question is, like, could the rest of the counties get together and vote to expel you? <laughs> Sometimes players get traded without consent. If you don't have that clause in your contract, you know. Hey, bad news. You've been traded to Maryland. I don't want to join Maryland. <laughs> That's what happens when you're a cancer in the clubhouse. Wow. Jim, <laughs> the possibilities are endless with this. West Virginia, you may have opened the door to a gold mine here. Let's just see where this goes. But uh, in the meantime, let's hope we actually keep some Second Amendment rights in uh, in Virginia. Not optimistic about it right now, but we'll see. Jim, oh, this almost felt like the end of the week, but sadly it's not. So see you Friday. See you Friday, Greg. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Columbus, Radio America. Thanks for being with us. Don't forget our friends over at Figs, wearfigs.com. Code Martini for 15% off your first purchase at checkout. Please subscribe to the podcast. Leave us a kind review if you please. And we will see you Friday for the next Three Martini Lunch.